go. Perfect. Welcome, everybody. Let us know where you're coming from in the chat. Happy Thursday. Sorry, guys, I can't uh, type and talk at the same time. This is very difficult for me. I should preset my message. Awesome. So excited for today's session, folks. Welcome. Happy Thursday. Great group coming out already. I see Texas, Perry Sound, New Mexico. Welcome, folks. Those of you joining us, please do make sure to turn your chat over to all panelists, all attendees. It's a little drop down that says two next to the two, and it generally says all panelists when you come in, but we wanna see where everybody's coming from. And of course, your great comments that you have. So if you pop it over to those two, we'll be able to see everything. Hello, Jamaica. Hello, Ottawa, Washington, Mississauga. Hello, Trenton, New Jersey, Trenton. There's also Trenton, Ontario, actually. Hello, Edmonton. Hope all is well. Hope folks are doing good. It is beautiful here in Toronto today. The sun, fabulous weather. Hello, Indiana. Some more folks from Jersey area. Vancouver, Texas. I think we have it from every corner here. Happening. Out Oregon way. Hello, Nova Scotia. There we go. Now we've got every corner coming out. I love it. Glad to have you all, folks. See, we're getting there. Toronto opens up as of, and we I keep my fingers crossed because I don't really want to jinx it, jinx it, as of tomorrow. So for us, um, for many folks who hopefully you're not in lockdown, we're just coming out of ours. And uh, tomorrow we're hopefully opening up to a patio, patio only, of course, no inside dining. I know, I'm just like this. Um, I won't rush out yet. I won't rush out, but I'm very, very excited to actually see people out and about and enjoying a bit more life again. So we're coming. All right, we got, we got two, I'm gonna give it two, three more minutes here. Then we're gonna get started because we have tons to cover today and the topic is so juicy. So I'm excited. Hello, San Antonio. Hello, Indiana. Some more folks from, hello, Kenya. Ooh, what time is it in Kenya? Exciting. Hello, New Mexico, Chicago. Folks just joining us, make sure to pop over your chat to all panelists, all attendees, please. Illinois, Pittsburgh, welcome folks. Please, we, I feel like we're gonna have tons of questions. So if you do have a question for Dr. Kara, please do pop it into the Q&A. Miss Kaya gets it on over here to myself and then we can get through hopefully as many as possible. Um, if you haven't, please do join our Facebook group. It's a fantastic group of, a fantastic group of people, I should say, um, who are there to, you know, there's so many pieces happening on there from collaboration to, you know, tips and tricks, passing on some great, re, you know, resource ideas, things like that. Uh, please do join our Facebook group if you haven't. Um, it's called Hi Mama Circle Time. Kyle, I'll get you to pop that in there for folks. There is three questions you do need to answer excuse me there to just uh, to join please make sure to answer those it's just there to keep the community safe okay folks hello iowa welcome 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 glad to have you folks here two more minutes and then we're gonna get into the fun of it hello from tanzania welcome back welcome back tanzania new jersey some more folks from toronto exciting I know we'll, we'll have a rush in in a moment of all the fantastic people who are coming right in on the dot. I know you guys have a very tight timeline. So hello, Alberta, Minnesota, some more great folks from Jamaica. I hope the weather is nice down there, guys. Hello from, oh, I missed it quickly there. The chat just blew by. Some more folks from Calgary. Quick reminder. If you've never been with us, we are recording the session. And as I say that, I always double check folks, just to make sure. Um, we are recording the whole session. It will be available with our uh, show notes that will be going out. Uh, if they're not out by you know, tomorrow, they're early next week. So very excited. Hello, Guam. Welcome. Mississauga, Michigan. The weather's warm down Jamaica. Hopefully it stays nice, comfortable. Florida, hello. Yeah, no, uh, no cascades yet. I know I'm. I say it a little odd, but uh, there. I haven't seen them yet. Don't know if I will. 
don't know if I'm in the right area. But... Fantastic. Here we go. Now you guys are you're piling in. Hello, hello. Happy Thursday, all. Welcome back. North Carolina. Hot in Dallas, I see. Hey, you guys, you get steamy down that way. Welcome back, Six Nations. Welcome back. Hello, folks. Here we go. We're going to give it one more minute and then we're going to get into the housekeeping. I know you folks are still rolling in. For those of you who are just joining us, please do pop into uh, your chat and uh, A, say hello, but make sure to pop it over to all panelists, all attendees. Uh, this way folks get to see actually the great questions you have and uh, and comments, things like that are going on uh, during the webinar. So please do that now. And it, all you have to do is there's a bit of a drop down next to the two and it usually says all panelists when you log on, you can just drop down and pick the other one. All right, I think it's just about time to get started. Welcome Indiana, Toronto, more folks from Edmonton, Windsor, California, fantastic. Minnesota, love it, love it, love it. All right, it's time to get this rocking and rolling. I'd say this is when I guess you should say cue the music, but no, we're going to turn it off. Okay, folks, let's dive in. First of all, welcome to Hi Mama Helps webinars. Today we're talking about uh, children with developmental delays and autism. It's a huge topic. Like I said, it's, it's pretty meaty and I'm excited to get into it because this is very important. Educators around the world, you, every one of us have an impact on what's happening, especially at a very early age and especially with these children specifically um, when it comes to making sure they're set up for success. So Let's jump into though the important bits. If you've never been with us before, this is the housekeeping. Let's get this out of the way quickly. But um, if you've never been with us, I am by no means your personal legal or financial advice or anyone here, uh, sadly, at Hi Mama. We definitely did not go to law school. Not here for any of that in information at the same time. We're here to give away get chips, tricks, techniques. If you're making any changes within your center, um, whether that be financial, legal, you know, or even something that might involve a licensing rep, please make sure you're consulting the right people. Um, I am the by far the last person you sadly want to talk to when it comes to all that great fun. All right, next up, let's, uh, we're just going to do our land acknowledgement quickly. So let's give it a great listen. Hi Mama acknowledges that our main headquarters is situated in Toronto, Ontario, on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Toronto itself is a word that originates from the Mohawk word Takaranto, meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing. As participants and guests in today's webinars, we are coming together from many different places around the world. We encourage you to learn about and acknowledge the land from which you participate. Fantastic. Let's just give a quick listen to our diversity and inclusion. Hi Mama is committed to fostering an inclusive and welcoming environment for our employees, customers, and community. Hi Mama welcomes and celebrates individuals of all backgrounds, orientations, and identities. Our diversity, inclusion, and belonging committee aims to ensure we provide a safe environment for everyone to thrive while bringing their authentic selves to work. Our mission is to promote an inclusive workspace for all employees through education, discussion, and celebration of our differences. Embracing these differences while coming together with a common purpose is what makes our team extra special. All right, a couple more housekeeping uh, pieces, and I'm sure you've already heard me say this part, but we always like to remind you we are recording. So the whole session will be made available we will be putting it up on our blog show notes page. So it will be there for you to download. It gives you access to the certificate as well as the slides if you are accessing the recording. So not to fret there. If you are in part of the session today, we will be sending you a certificate uh, by early next week for those who are there. And then once again, if you are accessing the recording, there will be a certificate made available for you. Okay, so just keep your eyes out for the show notes as they do come out. Just give or take a little bit more time for myself to prepare them. 
Next up, if you need the uh, CC tab, you can hit that there. We'll turn closed captions on for you. We're also recording with that. So if you do need that, your thumbs up. Last but not least, if you're having any issues with uh, Zoom itself, I highly recommend that you seek support.zoom.us. They're the best um, support for their tool folks. And uh, I'm sadly, I'm not, uh, I'm not the techie person that way. Um, so please do uh, seek support with them and they'll be able to help you out the best. Next up, before we dive into the fun of it, if you've never heard of us, please, 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 we'd love to take you through our app. We'd love to show you a little bit more about what you can do if you're a teacher, what you can do within your classroom from, you know, activity planning to, you know, assessments to communicating with mom and dad or parents and guardians, whoever it may be. And if you're on the businessy sides of things and looking at it from that perspective, we have tons of pieces there as well to help you out from just class management to, you know, billing uh, to, of course, communicating with parents that's also very very important all wrapped into one nice package if you do we can set you up with some time to chat with us on our side uh, tell them i sent you just tell them Maria sent you and um and just to know too we have a full support team here to help you out we have tons of free resources from podcasts to our webinars as you may know uh to all the activities we pop out to tons of just blog posts articles great pieces of information that's happening in the education space and as well we are b certified company and so just so you know that means that we make a so positive social impact on what we actually do in this case in the education space so we're here to help you out folks would love love to see before we do jump into intros though i want to do a quick poll for today oh come here poll there we go i'm going to launch the poll give you guys a minute to do so uh so we'd love to know just who's joining us today so what you're doing and then we'd love to know about how you track you know children's development how you share that with your families um you know whether you're doing paper sheets i i know for myself that was my main thing um if you're doing online um you know ongoing paper assessments. So there's a variety of element out there um, from, you know, ages and stages. That was personally the one I used to, you know, and there's so many new things from an app to like using Hi Mama, for example, to an online assessment tool. And, and yeah, it, you may not formally track it. And that's not so much that you're formally tracking it. It's more that it's tracked in different processes throughout the time. Give you 20 more seconds here. Fantastic group of educators. Love it. So happy to see that. You guys have 10 more seconds. No pressure. I'm just kidding. Um, well, I ended up here and then get into the, the best part of the webinar for today. So, oh, I'm excited. I'm giving you guys a couple more seconds. I can still see so folks are still uh, atten uh, adding to the poll. So I just wanted to get, get you there. Love it, love it. So just so you guys know, we have about 70% of you our educators here with us today. So I, that's absolutely fantastic. I hope every one of you are doing well. And between, I want to say between ongoing paper assessments and daily and, you know, paper daily sheets to online assessments tools. That's what most of you are showing here. And that's absolutely fantastic. So, all right, end that up. You won't be able to access that anymore. Thank you very much folks for that. Thank you, thank you. All righty then, um, let's jump into intros. If you've never been with us before, I am Rhea. I'm the community ambassador here at Hi Mama. I'm also an early childhood educator, and it is my pleasure to be here and hosting with you today. Um, I have no fun facts for myself today. Well, yeah, I actually do. I have a fun fact. This weekend, I actually plan on spending most of my time. We have a nice boat out on the water and being in on the water with, um, with my husband. So I'm super excited to do so and get some downtime, actually. So I'm going to welcome on my co-host, Miss Kaya. She's on the chat. Kaya, you're such a pleasure to work with. You're always, you just know when to drop it in the chat at the right moment. Folks, if you have any questions, send them on to Kaya. But Kaya, fun fact or anything for us today? Oh, geez, the pressure's on. Yeah, I'm actually <laughs> really surprised. I'm, I'm working with one screen here because I've uh, packed up my monitor already. If you didn't hear uh -oh. last week, I am moving. Um, so you're no longer going to get this lovely background in my living room. You're going to get a brand new Zoom background uh, for our our uh, webinars every Thursday. So that's exciting. Um, I guess that's my fun fact then. And um, I was talking to Stacy in the chat about the cicadas uh, yeah. or the cascades as you called it. I, I call I them laughing. cascades. I know, but 
I know it's I not love, right. I love the cicadas. It reminds me of my childhood and growing up in Tennessee and it like, it lulls me right to sleep. So as annoying as that sound is on a hot summer day, I absolutely love it. And I know like that's the sign of summer. So um, yeah, very excited for cicada season as random as that sounds <laughs> and very excited for today's session with uh, with Dr. Kara. I am as well. Thanks so much, Kaya. I'm I'm super, super excited to welcome on our special guest. We have Dr. Kara Goodwin joining us, psych, um, parenting translator, founder of, and we're going to link you guys out, folks, to all of these great things. Dr. Kara, please do join us. I'm so excited for you to be chatting about this very important topic. This is, it's, it's a hot topic. We've talked about it being, you know, very much in the limelight, more so now because of COVID, but maybe do you want to give us a small intro of yourself and a fun fact for today? Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Kara Goodwin. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I am a clinical psychologist, um, a mother to three children, and I founded um, a website with the goal of taking all the scientific research that is out there and um, translating it, I mean, making it accessible to um, you know parents and teachers and the people that really need this information um, on child development. And a fun fact, um, we, so we are currently um, in Jackson Hole right now on a family vacation. Um, so that's why I have this lovely wood in the background. I love it. Have and feel going on. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for joining us on our vac on your vacation. Of um, let's get into the fun of it, all of this, though. You and as well, I want to plug you for a minute. I was on your website looking around. There's so many amazing pieces. Um, there's just so many things. Like one of the things I'd love to go into more detail, but we'll we'll take care of that another day. Is just like talking a little bit more about, um, you know, like resolving conflict as well as like punishment side of things and, and what that does. And there's just so many great resources that you have. And I was in there and I was reading and I was so enthralled. And so Thank I you. highly recommend if you have not checked this website, look at this website because it is so handy to have as an educator, as a parent, doesn't matter who you are, actually. So thank All you right. so much. Look, we're, we'll get in. I'm going to stop talking now because really I, I want to hand the lamb light over to you. So I'm going to let you take it from here. And, and folks, please do enjoy. Dr. Kara, I'm here. So if you need anything, just yell at me and I've got you on, on this end. So. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into our material because, you know, there's a lot to cover. This is a big topic. Um, so some takeaways from today, I'm really hoping to give everybody um, some real tools to help um, children with autism and developmental disabilities, whether you're a teacher or a parent, I think, you know, I'm hoping that this will be really helpful to give you like some real things that you can do with your child um, or the child you're teaching today. Um, so some of the takeaways I have are that children with autism and developmental disabilities really benefit from visual aids and visual structures. And I'll talk about what that means. Um, and another takeaway is that increasing a child's engagement and motivation um, by getting their attention and using their interests and following their leads is really gonna enhance their learning. Um, and then I'm gonna go through, um, finally, um, a way to teach new skills for these children with special needs. So we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so first I'm gonna get into talking about what is autism and developmental delays and disabilities. And I realize um, a lot of you may already know this, but I think it can be helpful sometimes to just review that. So um, autism spectrum disorders is really a catch-all term. So it's kind of like, um, and developmental delays disabilities really is a catch-all term too, they both are. Um, it's kind of like when we say cancer, you know, there can be a lot of different presentations and a lot of different treatments. It's, it's a term that describes a lot of different things. Um, and a common saying that, um, you know, I use as a, as a psychologist is when you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism, meaning that every child with autism is different. And I think that's also true for children with developmental disabilities. You know, there, there's not one presentation that I think really defines it, but the, these are the, the terms that we have. Um, so autism spectrum disorders is defined as um, the presence of social and communication impairments um, alongside a cluster of um, behaviors that can include repetitive behaviors, 
um, special interests and an insistence on sameness, which means a preference for doing things the same way and a dislike of change. Um, and then developmental delays and disabilities, this is a little bit harder to define because they can just look so different in different children, but it, it involves any sort of um, motor language or behavioral skills that are not at the expected level given the child's chronological age. So, you know, we talk about a developmental age and a chronological age. So the chronological age would be according to their birthday, how old they currently are. So early signs for autism and developmental disabilities, um, and I'm focusing on the preschool age here because I think that's what a lot of people here are interested in. So it, for autism, some early signs that you'll see are um, a lack of eye contact, a tendency to not respond to their name. Um, you can see delayed language, um, difficulty with empathy or understanding the feelings of others. Um, you can see a loss of skills, um, which we refer to as regression. And that means, you know, for example, a child was speaking in sentences and then, you know, later is not speaking in sentences anymore. Um, you can often see difficulty with change. Um, as I mentioned, that's a symptom of autism. Um, a preference for solitude or a lack of interest in other children. Um, repetitive behaviors and um, sensory differ differences. So either um, more sensory interests or um, more aversive reactions to sensory stimuli. Um, and, um, you know, I should also say that one of these symptoms would not be cause for concern. It would be when you're starting to see a pattern of several of these symptoms that you would really start being concerned, um, you know, is this autism. Um, so developmental delays, disabilities. Um, so like I said, that can look so different. So I think a really useful resource for, you know, figuring out is my child really delayed is the CDC has on their website developmental milestones that you would expect at every age. So for example, if your child was 24 months, you could Google CDC developmental milestones 24 months and see what exactly in the different domains your child is, is expected to do at that age. Um, and you can also consult with your pediatrician um, because they are specialized in developmental milestones as well. Um, the really, what I really want to emphasize here is that early intervention is so important, um, and that's why we want to look for these early signs and try to identify children who are at, at risk early, um, because early intervention is really how we are going to have the biggest impact on the child's later development. Um, so we know that intervention at any time can be helpful. So it's not like you only have this window, but early intervention is so helpful in, in helping children with autism to and, and developmental disabilities to really achieve their potential. Um, so I really advise to not follow the wait and see approach. You know, a lot of parents hear this or maybe they think this, you know, themselves that it, maybe we'll just wait and see and see if the child catches up. But you, in doing so, you could be missing a key opportunity for early intervention. Um, and it, it never hurts to have your child evaluated. You know, worst comes to worst, you're going to find out more information about your child. Um, so, so as, you know, as a parent and, you know, as an educator, I would encourage parents to seek early intervention services for an evaluation as soon as you have any sort of concern um, and to really follow your own intuition. Um, you know, if, if you're concerned, but people around you are telling you, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay to really follow your, your own intuition that something is off and, and to seek an evaluation. And, and maybe you're wrong, but it, it's worth looking into. So the next thing I would like to talk about is setting the child up for success. So this could be either in your classroom or at home. So the strategies that you can use that will set your child up um, for maximum learning. Um, so as I mentioned in the takeaways, children with autism and developmental disabilities really benefit from visual aids and structure. Um, so basically we live in an auditory world where um, a lot of our, you know, our conversations, a lot of the way we exchange information is auditory. And that is not how children with autism and developmental disabilities learn best. So we want to, whenever possible, make it visual. 
So the first way you can do that is to structure your classroom or your home based on the different activities your child will be engaging in and try to minimize distractions. For example, you know, there's one part of your classroom or your home where you always read books. And so your child knows when I'm sitting in this part of the couch, I'm going to be sitting quietly and reading a book. So the, this visual structure will give your child cues for how to behave. Um, another great visual tool that I, um, I included a picture of in the slides here is um, the first then board. So this is just a, a picture. So you just have first on one side and then on the other side, and you have something you would, a behavior you would expect your child to do before another behavior. The then behavior is usually something rewarding. So in this example, it's first put your toys away and then you get to play on the computer. Um, and you can start off with pictures. Um, and as your child gets older and learn to read, it could just be writing. Um, but this can be really helpful um, to, for motivating children to you know, do maybe the non-preferred behavior so that they can get to the preferred activity. Um, something else that's really helpful is a visual schedule. So this would be breaking down different activities um, or, you know, the course of your day into a, into a schedule that is posted in a place that's very obvious for your child to see. And this can be useful even if your child does not read yet. So it doesn't have to be complicated. You could draw a very simple picture. You could print something off um, from the internet, you know, something that you find with Google image um, and, and go through and have kind of a checklist. And if your child is old enough, they could even check off the schedule themselves and that could help them to see how they are moving through the schedule. Um, another great visual aid is something that we call social stories. Um, and these are stories which help to explain to a child um, maybe a new situation or um, a new behavior that's being expected to them. For example, you know, if, if your child is going to go to the dentist for the first time. You could have a social story that breaks down, okay, this is what's going to happen, and this is the behavior that's expected of you. Um, and you can find some of these social stories online to buy, or you can even write them yourself um, with simple, you know, simple pictures that you find through Google image and simple, um, you know, text. It, it really, it doesn't take that much um, effort, although I, it does take some effort. Um, and finally, a visual aid that can be really helpful is um, peer models. Um, so this is especially in the classroom. If you have a child who you know is a great, um, you know, is a great model, having them sit next to the, the child with autism or developmental disabilities, and the child can refer to that person and, and see kind of what the behavior is expected of them. Okay, we can move. Okay. Um, the next step I would suggest to set your child up success for success is to follow predictable schedules and routines. So like I mentioned, a visual schedule is really helpful and that can also keep you in um, on task in terms of having a schedule and a routine that you follow. Um, the schedule can also be really helpful to prepare the child for transitions to the next activity. Um, but even having the schedule, we want to make sure that we use other visual ways to prepare children for the transition. Um, a timer is a great option for this. There's a visual timer called a time timer that shows the child um, visually how much time they have left. Um, you, you, know, you can also give verbal warnings if you're not in a place where you have the ability to use a visual. You could have tokens where your child you know, hands you a token for each minute they have left at the playground, for example. Um, so making sure that we prepare children for these transitions because for children with autism and developmental disabilities, transitions can be a big source of, um, of distress. Um, then I would also suggest that you, you know, really make explicit the classroom rules and expectations, or if you're at home, you know, your rules and expectations, you know, something vague like be kind is, is not going to translate um, well for these children. And I think, you know, you want to be as explicit as possible, you know, say use gentle hands, for example, would be a way of, of stating it in a more concrete way. Um, and then I have, you know, some parents and teachers ask me, well, if we, if we do all these schedules and routines, 
um, isn't it just going to make it harder for the child to transition and harder for them to um, deal with change? And I, what I would suggest is through their visual schedule to gradually expose them to change in the schedule um, if you feel like the child is ready for that and, and make sure, you know, we are following a schedule, but we are following a flexible schedule because that's the real world that our schedule does does change and to gradually expose the child to change and to give them some coping skills to handle that. Okay, next slide. Um, so next I'd like to talk about engaging the child. So um, engaging a child with autism or developmental disabilities can be particularly challenging because sometimes they do not have um, the social motivation that a typically developing child might have. Um, so we want to use some specific strategies to really get their attention and engage them so that they can benefit from learning. So a, a term that I like to use is to get into the spotlight of their attention. So if you imagine that where they are looking, they have a spotlight attached to their head and you want to be in whatever that spotlight is shining on. And that involves, you know, a little bit of gymnastics of getting down on the floor and really, you know, following them around and getting into the spotlight of their attention, even if that's difficult. Um, and when you are in the spotlight of their attention, you want to start by following their lead. So seeing which, um, which toys and activities they're attracted to. And you wanna then engage in the toys that they are engaging in. So we want to follow their lead in order to get their attention and then we can maximize their learning in that situation. Um, another way to really get their attention is to use imitation. So when we imitate their actions, they're more likely to pay attention to us and also imitate us as well. So we want to try to imitate their actions um, and use something called active listening, which means that, you know, if the child is verbal, you would um, repeat and expand on anything they say. Um, if they are only making noises, you would also repeat and expand on that. So if they said, bah, you could say, yes, this is a ball. Um, and if the child is not speaking yet, you would imitate their actions as a way of active listening. Okay, next. Um, the other thing that's really important is finding the motivation for um, this particular child. And it's different for every child. Um, we talk a lot about finding the smile or finding the fun. Um, and this can be particularly hard for children with autism because they are known to have reduced social smiling. So you, you have to work a little bit harder than you would with a typically developing child. Um, so you want to use, um, you know, whatever activity or toys that you notice a smile or some sort of positive reaction from them, because we, we really want to increase their um, motivation in the social interaction and in the learning opportunity. Um, as we all know from school, um, we all learn better when we um, have positive emotions. So if, imagine a class, you know, that you loved in school versus a class that you couldn't stand and how much more you could learn from the class that you loved. So we, what we want to do is really increase the child's um, positive emotions, and that will then increase their learning. So you can also complete a preference assessment, um, which would be trying to figure out, you know, presenting them with different toys and trying to figure out which toy really, um, you know, motivates them. Um, and finally, I would say, don't be afraid to incorporate really strong interests. You know, sometimes I think parents and teachers get worried about bringing in something that the child is just obsessed with because they're going to get distracted. But research shows that actually bringing in these strong interests is more likely to enhance their learning. So, so don't be afraid to, to figure out what their strong interests are and then bring them into the learning and, and use those strong interests to then enhance social learning, um, which may not come as naturally for them. Um, so challenging behavior. Um, so this is a question I get from a lot of parents and teachers who work with these populations. So I wish that there was just one cure-all cure -all that I could give you for challenging behavior, but um, unfortunately, every um, instance of challenging behavior in children 
is different. So we, the first step is figuring out what is the function of this challenging behavior? Um, because children are not, you know, acting, being difficult just to be difficult. There's some something that they are gaining from this and we need to figure out what it is. So I would suggest first keeping a chart of what is happening before the behavior, during the behavior and after the behavior and keep that for, you know, as long as you can, you know, if, if you have a week or a few weeks to, to really understand what's going on with this behavior. And after you keep that chart, you can then analyze it and try to figure out what is the function of this behavior. We, we often think of four functions of behavior. So attention, which is to get attention from others. Um, tangible, which means to get um, a certain object or activity. Um, escape, which means to get out of a certain activity. Um, or sensory, which means, you know, uh, textures or sounds or some sort of sensory experience that they are in either enjoying or um, are very averse to. So we want to figure out which category does it fall into. And then we want to figure out a way to um, for them to gain the same thing, but in a functional way. So in the example on this slide, um, you know, the child is, um, is screaming and throwing toys when asked to pick up. Um, and the, the, the child is effectively getting out of cleaning, cleaning up their toys. Um, so what we, what we want to do is to figure out, um, a functional way, you know, maybe they don't have the option of getting out of cleaning their toys, but we want to, we want to make it less aversive for them so that they will engage in that. Um, you know, if they are, are throwing a tantrum because they need help. Um, with something, we want to teach them, you know, how to say, help me instead of throwing the tantrum, because then they still are getting the same gain, or sorry, same gain, but um, without the challenging behavior. I can move to the next. Um, so teaching new skills. Um, so teaching new skills can often be more challenging with children with autism and developmental um, disabilities. So what you want to do is really break it down into small steps. And then we want to do something called chaining, where you teach one step at a time. Um, this helps children to have more success in learning it and to, um, and to not get frustrated. Um, so for example, with hand washing, you know, rather than showing the child all, every one of the, you know, four or five steps involved, you want to break it down into what is, you know, turn on the water is the first step. So break it down into really small steps and then work on each one. And then, you know, once you've mastered one step, try to link it to the next step. Um, and how you do this, teach a new skill is to use prompts. So prompts are tools that we use as parents and teachers to um, teach them these skills. And what you want to do is you want to start at the bottom with the full, when you're teaching a new skill, start at the bottom with the full physical, which means if our child has never washed their hands, we have to show them how to do it by taking their hands. And, you know, if the first step's turning on the water, turning, you know, take their hand, put it on the faucet, turn the water and show them. And then gradually we move up this hierarchy and do less and less for them so that eventually they are gaining independence and doing it for themselves. And then, so we, so that's called fading the prompts when we do less and less for them. And then eventually after they've learned the skill, you know, and we want to encourage them to do it, you want to go the other way on the prompt hierarchy. So you start with the least prompt. So you might start with um, the natural environmental one, which would be like, they get into the bathroom and they might know to wash their hands. If they come to the bathroom and they aren't, you know, getting started with the hand washing routine, that's when you would gesture and point to the sink, for example. And then you would do move up the prompt hierarchy very gradually with the idea that we want them to work towards as much independence as possible. Um, and another question I get a lot is encouraging language and communication. How do I teach this? So 
children with autism and developmental disabilities are often delayed in language and, and communication is so important, you know, for social needs, but also for preventing challenging behaviors. So the, the most important advice I could give you is wait. Um, a lot of times, you know, especially as parents and teachers that know the child very well, we step in and do things for the child because we know what they, you know, we know they always want Cheerios for snacks. So why would we wait? Because we know that's what they're going to ask for. But so to instead really take the time and wait, you know, maybe even pretend like you don't know what the child wants um, and wait for them to make some sort of communicative sign. Um, if they are verbal, it could be asking for the snack or the toy. Um, if they aren't verbal yet, it could be as simple as reaching towards what they want. So you're holding up two different choices and they reach towards the one that they want. And we then encourage that and reward it by giving them the one they reach towards. Um, and then eventually the reaching, we would want to work up from reaching to reaching with a vocalization and then reaching with language um, and, and work towards more and more advanced communication. So, so again, the biggest strategy I could give is wait for the child to make some sort of communication. Um, then I would also advise um, narrating and labeling everything. So the more language input the child receives, the more um, they are going to be able to produce. So, so make sure that you are, um, you know, speaking as much as possible around them and labeling what, you know, different objects and activities for them. Um, imitating, um, as I mentioned before, imitating is very um, naturally rewarding. So, um, you know, if your child is speaking to imitate and expand on their verbalizations, if they are, um, you know, if they are only at the point where they're making, um, you know, noises that aren't quite words, imitate those noises and expand on them by, by thinking of a related word and, and using that word. Um, if, if your child is um, only engaging in actions as communication, like reaching, then, then you can imitate that as well and add in uh, a verbalization. Um, finally, you can use songs and highly motivating tasks. For example, you know, the tickle monster. Um, you can, what you want to do is say the tickle monster is going to get you and then you pause. And at, you know, assuming they know what the tickle monster is and have done this routine a few times, they will probably, and, and, and that they like it, they'll do some sort of either action or verbalization that says, you know, tickle me. And so you want to wait for that and then tickle them. Um, another highly motivating task for a lot of children is swinging them or throwing them in the air. So, you know, pause at that moment right before you throw them into the air and wait for some sort of communication. Um, if there's a song that they really love, pause in the song and wait for them to add in the words. Um, and so, yeah, so, and songs and finger plays are also known to be um, great for enhancing language abilities as well. Okay, and finally, um, encouraging social development. So a great way to um, encourage social development is through play. So, um, you know, we often work on social skills in a very naturalistic play environment. Um, and I just wanted to give you a few um, skills that you could work on with children with autism and developmental disabilities in the social realm. Um, so eye contact, one way we work on this is bringing toys or um, objects that they're interested in near our eyes. So um, if you have a child that's looking only at the toys, bringing it up to your eyes so that they eventually are looking up and engaging with people's eyes. Um, turn taking is another really important skill for children to learn um, in, in playing with others. And, and turn taking in play eventually becomes turn taking in conversation. So it's a very important skill even up into adulthood. Um, and a way you can work on that is start gradually. So start with really quick turns and that's um, naturally rewarding for children. Um, and then gradually work up to longer turns. Um, and I should also say, start with less preferred objects because they're probably, if they have never engaged in turn taking, probably not best to start with their favorite thing in the world. Um, imitation 
is also a great skill to work on. And like I've mentioned several times throughout this webinar, you know, the first step would be imitating them in hopes that then they would imitate you back. Um, and finally, play skills. Um, children with autism and developmental disabilities sometimes can get stuck on playing with toys in the same way. So we want to really vary their play skills. So for example, if they are lining up their cars, you could imitate them by lining up their cars and then show them a variation on the play skills. Like maybe the cars could crash together. Maybe they would see that's really fun and, and then imitate you in that play. Okay, and that's all I have for today. I hope I didn't run through that too quickly and I would love to um, answer any questions that anybody has. Well, there's so many questions. First, Dr. Okay. Kara, that was amazing. Um, I was very, I was so enthralled. And, and as you were going through some of the things, I was having a bit of like, like memories of like some of the things I used to do in my classroom. So for example, the first and then board, it was very popular. Just, just in general, I found that it also helped just the whole class kind of get through different transitions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking like around the three-year-old mark, right? So it was very nice to have it overall because all of the children were participating in it. And then this way, when um, the child that I had, who was particularly, um, you know, he, he was nonverbal, he was pretty high on the spectrum when it came to what he was doing. And, and he just got kind of looped into the group and incest on. And in that part, I loved about, and of course, with that age group, they don't really notice really anything that's happening. But let's dive in. I got to find all the fantastic questions that we have here. There's a whole list. Um, so folks, if I don't get to yours, I'm very sorry, because there is quite a few, but hopefully we do get through most to them. Okay, let's get started here. So we're going to start very top question from Donna. Um, and, and we've had a couple of questions about, you know, around approaching parents. So I may loop this in and into a couple, but how do you approach a parent maybe on um, making them aware that the child has a developmental delay or they have concerns? Do you have any recommendations for educators or directors, whoever you may be about getting that conversation going? Yeah, so this is really hard and I would go into this um, conversation very prepared because this is very, very hard for any parent to hear um, mm. as any of us who are parents could understand um, if hearing anything that's wrong with your child is is going to be painful. Um, mm -hmm. So going into it with empathy and, and being prepared for the conversation, like I would write out in advance what you're planning to say because I think it's it's very important to be sensitive to that. Um, how I would approach it is I would describe in, um, in as objective way as possible the specific behaviors that I'm seeing. And then I would compare that to what I would expect to see at that child's age because a lot of parents um, are not aware, you know, especially if it's your first child, um, are not aware of, you know, what would we expect from a typical two-year-old? Um, mm -hmm. So, so I would describe, you know, if, even if it's like you watch the child and just write down the behaviors that you see, just totally objectively, and describe the behaviors. So, come to the parent um, with describing the behaviors and then comparing them to what the child, what you would expect the child to see. Um, and then I would also, in that conversation, be prepared with. Um, at least three or four of the child's really, you know, strong strengths. So come with some, come in with some positive, yep. um, because, you know, I, I, it's hard for parents to hear. And I think parents will, will be a lot more receptive if they understand that you see their child and you see all the wonderful things about their child too. Um, and, and then I would explain that, you know, that, that, you as their teacher are not sure because, you know, as a teacher, even if you have tons of experience with autism and developmental disabilities, you're not able in the classroom setting usually to do an evaluation. So say that, you know, you're not sure this is what you're seeing and that, you know, uh, that an evaluation isn't going to hurt your child and worse comes to worse, they'll come out, the parents will come out of it with more information on their child, which would be great to, to have. Um, and that, um, you know, e explaining the evaluation process can also be helpful for parents because mm. I think a lot of parents like don't know what to expect and that's scary. Um, so explaining that, you know, 
who you would see and what what exactly they would do and and how they would deliver the news to you can be helpful for parents. It's, it's so true. It's a, it's a hard time for any parent to, it's like you said, especially if it is their first child and they're going through this and, and they, and they don't know what to expect. N- none of them and none of us generally know really what to expect, what's going to come at the end of all of that. So it's yeah. a very scary time. And, and I definitely think the being objective is, is a huge part, but I like, I like how you follow that up with noticing what the, what the positives are of that. And you know, that yes, your child is still doing great things. Um, it's just, these are the flags that we are seeing and, and we're, we are concerned because of them. And and that's a huge piece. So um, let's dive into the first and then boards, actually. Do you recommend these for younger groups? Do you think they're beneficial? What's your thoughts on when you can start using a board like that? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on when the child understands that a picture means uh, represents something. um, And that can happen at different ages for different children. Um, you can also use actual objects in the first then board. So, um, for example, um, you could do like, if it's first wash your face, then we're going to get in the car and, you know, maybe the child likes getting in the car to go to the playground or whatever. You could have like a washcloth in the first spot and then a key in the then spot. Um, so I think it, it really depends on when your child gets that concept of, of, you know, even that a young child may not even get the concept that like the keys represent the car. So Mm. they're really being aware of when your child gets that concept and then, um, and then you can use it. Um, usually I would say around, um, two or so children are able to understand that if they are following kind of a typical trajectory. Very good. Yeah. I I love that. Um, yeah, it really depends on the development of the group too and wh- where they're all at. And, and of course, age is a, a pretty large factor of what when to use those important things, right? You're, you're obviously not going to use some, you know, six month old, they're probably not going to make those connections. So, and most educators are very aware of that. So um, yeah. next question up is what do we do? And I kind of actually relate to this myself. What do we do with a child who is autistic, but is very stubborn? I, I relate to the stubborn side of this question. Any recommendations if they're pretty set in their ways? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that is, um, you know, it's common of all young children, let's be honest, um, to be stubborn and, and want to do it their way. And I think that's when finding the motivation and finding the fun and the smile is really important. Um, so really bringing in their interests and following their lead, but that's when you, so after you following their lead and bringing your interest, that's when you bring in your own agenda in the context of what's fun for them. Very true. Very true. Um, next question, sign language. Um, do you have any recommendations on when to incorporate sign language? Is there too young or, you know, is there too old to start or what's your thoughts around that with, especially with children with disabilities and delays yeah. in some cases? Yeah, you know, there isn't a ton of research on sign language. Um, There is some research um, that it can help to reduce frustration because it gives children another um, method of communication, which, you know, a a lot of, um, you know, meltdowns and tantrums in children with autism and developmental disabilities happen because they don't have the words to communicate their needs, which any of us can imagine would be so frustrating. So, um, you know, I would suggest um, to, it doesn't hurt to try saying sign language. I mean, we know we also know that using sign language is not going to in any way delay their verbal language, which I know can be a concern of some parents and teachers. Mm-hmm. So if anything, um, there's some research that says it might even encourage verbal verbal development. So, um, and, and you should always pair it with verbal development if you want the child to to speak verbally. Um, if, if you want them to only speak in sign language, then you can do that. But, but if you would like the child to eventually have some verbal communication, try to pair it with the verbal, um, communication. And, you know, I would say start as, as early as you can, you know, there's some research that shows even, you know, five, six month old babies will pay attention to sign language. So, um, Mm -hmm. so you can start as early as you would like. And, and I think it's, it could only be helpful for your child. I, I totally agree. Um, it's something we also use at the center that I worked at, especially with, um, we had a couple of children who had Down syndrome and they 
they started talking because of it. They Yes, they're still using their hands and it was fantastic to see them developing both those skills. So, um, okay, let's, I'm gonna kind of turn it back to COVID for a little bit, because of course that's still the elephant in the room. Hopefully we get rid of it soon. But of course there's been so much more screen time because of COVID and especially when it comes to education and no, no matter what the age, I think there's just been so much more screen time. How do you recommend um, balancing motivation, screen time and too much screen time, especially especially if a child is delayed in some sort of way. Yes, with so with any young children and um, particularly children with autism and developmental disabilities, I would always have screen time a part of a routine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously if you're in a situation where you can completely avoid screen time for young children, I would advise that um, because children you know, all children, but particularly children with autism and developmental disabilities are going to learn better from naturalistic interactions with other people, um, mm -hmm. even more so than from the, if you imagine the most high quality educational show there is out there, children will still learn more from an interaction with a, another person. Um, so, so you, if you're in a situation where you can completely avoid security time, that's amazing. A lot of us, especially, um, you know, parents who have children with special needs, that's not a, a possibility. So you want to think about um, when you need the screen time the most and have that part of your schedule and have that built into your visual schedule that you use with your child so they know when it's coming. Um, and it could, it could happen after um, a non-preferred activity, for example. Mm -hmm. So they know when they look at the visual schedule, okay, I need to get through this non-preferred activity if I want to earn, or, you know, get to the screen time that I have. Um, so make sure it's part of your routine and um, and something that, that you are using, you know, as a tool um, to either help with behavior or to um, give yourself a break as a parent, which is something that we all need. 100%. Um, let's talk about masks. I know in, in some places, I know this is changing across the board and that many centers are, you know, either moving away from masks or uh, children aren't having to wear them now, or they're still fully masked. I know it's a bit of variety across the board right now, but for those children who are, you know, potentially up of that age where they're having to wear a mask and they do maybe have a delay. Um, what's your thoughts on that in regards to like sensory? Do you think, or have you been hearing that it's been making more issues or is there been like a lot of talk about children wearing masks in regard to how that fits into the sensory feelings? Yeah. Yeah. This is a huge concern of mine. And I wish I could tell you that like, you know, masks will have no impact on children, but we just, you know, we don't know. Unfortunately, yeah. even our kids, have all been the guinea pigs in this terrible experiment. And, you know, we don't know the long-term impacts of wearing masks. Um, I will say that, you know, I hope that children are more resilient and, you know, particularly children with autism have difficulty attending to the eyes and often attend to the mouth instead. So I'm hoping that it will force um, children, especially children with social impairments, to attend to the eyes and learn to take cues about emotions and language from the eyes. Um, but, but, you know, we don't know the long-term impacts. Um, and, and as you mentioned that um, mm. the sensory element is an important one too, that um, even getting children with sensory issues to wear masks is going to be a challenge. Um, and, and, you know, I think what we can do is to really maximize are unmasked time. So if your child is wearing mask all day at, at preschool and is around teachers wearing masks all day to when you get home, um, you know, focus on a little bit more face-to-face -face interaction if you have the ability mm -hmm. and, and try to maximize that time that your child sees you unmasked. Um, something else I've recommended for parents is to, um, and this is with slightly older children, is to play kind of like a, a guessing game where you're making different sorts of emotions underneath your mask and work on the children um, guess, you know, if you're smiling, you know, then take off your mask and, and to show them what it looks like, different emotions look like while masked and unmasked. I love that. I've, I've also seen the, I would say the opposite where, um, but they've had like different stickers they can put on the fronts of their masks. 
Um, I don't know yeah. how good that is, but anyway, yeah. at least it's fun um, <laughs> at the same time. Okay, we only have time for two more. Uh, changing the topic and going back to, um, you'd mentioned like a, an object of interest, whether that be a toy, a book, whatever it may be, but you'd mentioned something of interest that the child is particularly interested in or heavily interested in. I know from the wee little man that I worked with, he uh, loved Thomas the Train and that was his go-to. We always had trains for him because of that. Um, is there a point where it might get harmful, you think? Or is it like the obsession of it? Or is there generally no, no concern around that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So yeah, I would definitely suggest bringing those interests into teaching things they're not as interested in like social skills, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if they are only ever playing with Thomas the Train, for example, they're missing out on learning opportunities from other toys. So mm -hmm. what I would do is, you know, teach them first a way to play with Thomas the train and another toy and eventually fade Thomas and, and, you know, try to vary their play a little bit more because we want them to be playing with more than just one toy. Does that Very much address so. the question? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. hundred percent. Last question here before we jump in a wrap up. Um, Susan's asked if you could please talk about using strategies for children who may simply struggle with social skills and they may not have a diagnosis, a delay or any of those kinds, but do you have any recommendations you can give out to the crew here? Yeah. So I would say the same as I've been giving here. So children who, sorry, um, oh, good. struggle with social <laughs> skills, you know, um, making it explicit. And I think, you know, a lot of our children after going through the pandemic, even typically developed children might need this, making it explicit as possible. You know, this is how much space, for example, you give another person. This is how you greet another person, making it explicit and making it visual, either through a visual schedule or a social story. Awesome. Fantastic set of tips. This has been amazing. Dr. Kerr, I've learned so much. I think I can say for the crew who are here that they've been learning a lot. You've been getting tons of love in the chat. Before we let you go, do you have any last words, piece of advice, happy thoughts you want to leave us with today? Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that children with autism have so, and developmental disabilities have so many strengths and wonderful skills. So to really, you know, as a teacher, as a parent, really focus on the positives because I think um, when you think about it, you'll find that there, there are a lot. Dr. Kara, thank you so much from everyone at Hi Mama, from everyone in the chat. It's been such a pleasure having you on. Folks, we're going to connect you up with Dr. Kara. So if you did sadly not get your question answered, please do either follow her on Instagram, check out her website. I'm sure you can connect up with her and maybe get a couple of questions asked. But thank you so much for taking time out of your vacation to be here today. Um, she's coming back, folks. Um, let's jump into wrap up here. Uh, she is coming back. Sorry, not next week, but she will be coming back in July. So if you do want to keep an eye out for that registration, it will be in our newsletter and I'll get Kaya to pop it in now. But if you want to register for our newsletter, you will see it come back. And this way, you don't miss out on anything there. But thank you so much. Uh, wrap up, folks. As always, if you're in the live session, I will be sending out their certificate. So please, 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 they will be coming by early next week. So just keep an eye out on your email there, as well as the show notes will be coming out by early next week. So you'll be able to access the recording to this guy if you want to look back, as well as the slides. Uh, so they will all be there. But next week, we're talking about the curiosity approach. We have some fantastic ladies joining us all the way from the UK. Um, it will be their evening. I'm excited to have them on 2 p.m. next Thursday. Same place, basically, folks, same time. Um, obviously, just different, you know, different date. But at the end of the day, please do sign up. We'll have everything set up for you later on today. So if you haven't heard Dr. Kara's podcast as well, um, first of all, you should. I'll get Kai to drop that one as well in the, in the chat. It was a fantastic one you did with Ron. I enjoyed it. I was on the edge of my seat. I was actually walking, and I walked so much faster when I listen to a podcast. So I was walking and I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. Please do check it out. I'll also make sure that that's included in the show notes for you folks if you want to give it a listen. But follow us on social media as well as Dr. Kara on her Instagram. But you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to our podcast. And please do subscribe to our newsletter. You can get that and you can get some great tips that come out through the week, articles, you name it. It all comes right to your inbox. Thank you so much for joining us today. Right on time, Miss Kaya, come on back. Make sure I don't miss anything. I always check with you before we end. This way I don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you and I would both get in trouble. That was a fantastic session. I was taking notes. I mean, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but 
um, you know, maybe one day I may need some of these resources. So Dr. Kara, thank you so much for all those amazing resources. And we can't wait to have you back in July. Yes. Yes. I'm excited. That was fun. Thank you so much, everyone. Please do stay healthy, stay safe. Enjoy the rest of what's left of this week. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you all next Thursday. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.